We like to think that we are in control of our lives and our decisions, but if you think about it, all of our surroundings have been designed. You've likely heard before about the tactics that supermarkets use to make you buy more. For putting junk food at the very end of the shop so by the time you get there, you're feeling tired and overwhelmed enough to maybe pick up something that you didn't originally plan to. Or maybe putting expensive items at eye level where they're easier to grab and the cheaper items are down the bottom where they're less accessible. And the classic example, of course, is to put sweets aimed at children at the checkout where they can bug their parents to buy them as they wait in line. It's not just supermarkets that use these tactics, it's all around us. All public spaces and even our own homes have a design element that influences us, even when we don't realize. What does this have to do with practice? Well, everything. <laughs> the thing is, we're actually less in control of our decisions than we think and our brain is hardwired to want to take the most obvious, convenient, and easy option. It's quite possible that you've never given any thought to the place that you practice music, and there could actually be elements present that either encourage or hinder your ability to practice. If you'd like to learn more, keep watching. Lovely ones, this is Livia. I'm a professional operatic soprano, voice teacher, and the founder of Singing for Self Care. If you like health and heart based singing, I highly suggest you subscribe because I'm here for you every Monday with tips on your most powerful method of self care your voice. <laughs> because remember, you and your voice are practically magic. <laughs> The author James Clear, from whom I was really inspired to make this video, has a wonderful quote that environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. This is a concept that goes two ways, in aligning us with constructive habits towards our goals and distracting us with not so constructive habits that prevent us from reaching our full potential. In short, the place where you practice has quite an influence on the quality of your practice and consequently, progress as a musician. Scientists believe that up to about half of our brain's resources are used on vision and that is our most dominant sense. So naturally when we're talking about environment and in this case our practice space it makes sense that visual cues are very important. So in short a shift in what we can see causes a shift in how we behave. Now cues are all around us. Chances are if someone smiles at you you're automatically going to smile back. If you see a red light you stop. You see your shoelace untied, you're going to go and tie it up. So cues are anything that trigger us to action. The good news here is that it's completely within your control to design a practice space for yourself that gears you up for success. If you're someone who practices at home, chances are that there are some things creating resistance to your practice schedule. It doesn't matter if you're super messy or super tidy. Perhaps you're a stereotypical artist who lives in a chaotic environment with stuff everywhere. There's just a lot of visual noise that might distract you from positive visual cues. On the other side of this, if you're a person who's very tidy and you have everything kind of nice and stored away, it can become very easy to ignore visual cues entirely. It's a bit like that saying, out of sight, out of mind. So I'm wondering what it is like for you guys, but I used to be a total grot up until I was about 21 or 22 and then I did this weird like 180 and became super tidy. <laughs> Clutter makes me feel a bit like uncomfortable. And what are you guys like? Do you like kind of that lived in comfy mess kind of thing or do you like everything to kind of be nice and tidy? Let me know in the comments below. So either side of the equation isn't perfect but the key here is intention. You can strategically and intentionally place visual cues or triggers into your environment to increase the amount of times you draw your attention to practicing. So what could these triggers be? In next week's video, I'm gonna be giving a little tour of my studio and my workspace where I'll go into a bit of detail about how I've designed that space. So make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications from me so you don't miss that. But a few examples of this could be making it as easy as possible to access your keyboard, or if you play a different instrument, you could leave its case in a really obvious spot. Or if it's safe, maybe you could even leave your instrument out of its case. You could put your music on your dining table or desk or just somewhere where you're going to see it constantly as you go about your day. Or another example that I like is to have a habit tracker or practice calendar in plain view to keep you motivated. If you want a video on habit trackers in future, because 
they're awesome, I love them, <laughs> let me know in the comments. Now it's important to address the opposite side of this coin too. So have a think about what your biggest distractions are when it comes to practice. Perhaps it's something that makes practice harder or it could be something that you procrastinate with. It's much easier to avoid temptation than to constantly resist it because no matter how good you are at it, self-control is always just a short-term strategy. So just make it easier for yourself and get rid of your distractions entirely. So for most people, I guess this is their phone. I mean, in my experience, signing out of your social media accounts, or even better, if you just delete the apps off your phone entirely, is a real game changer. So not just for music, but for life in general. You could use a time blocker app so you can't access your phone for a certain duration. Or the simplest and most effective option is just to put your phone in a different room. If you find yourself wanting to play your console instead of practicing, you can unplug it after every use and put it in a cupboard when you're done. So when you design your environment like this and you make distractions quite hard and frankly quite annoying <laughs> to get to, you'll really surprise yourself with how much work you can actually get done. Whilst we've established the objects in our space play a really big part in our behaviour, we also need to look at our relationship with these objects. So visual cues mean different things to different people. A computer to some may mean, okay, it's work time, ready to do my emails. And for other people, it may mean it's time to play World of Warcraft. The larger picture to visual cues is the context of location. So for example, chances are that when you go into a library, there's a combination of visual cues in the environment and you have experience with those. You automatically know that you need to keep the noise down. So we condition ourselves to the needs of different environments through context. And this conditioning is something that is fluid. We can change it. A really great example of this is anything related to sleep hygiene. So it's common knowledge that for the best quality sleep, you should reserve your bed for sleep and sex. If you make a habit of watching TV or scrolling on your phone or doing work on your laptop in bed, you run the risk of associating your bed with those activities, which makes it harder to relax and go to sleep. If you always do a certain thing in a certain location, you will automatically associate being in that space with doing that action. So having a well-designed practice space set up that you can associate with practice, the action is gonna be easy. Now this isn't to say you need a whole designated music room for this to be effective. So just rearranging your space into specific zones can make all the difference. So design each space with different activities in mind and make sure you don't have conflicting cues. So for example, the small room where I am in right now, <laughs> where I'm sitting here is my YouTube corner. Over there is where I record music and I do my practice. And here, where you are, where you're sitting, uh, is where I teach online, I edit my videos and do any other work I need to do on the computer. So I can show you all of that next week. Another example, I have one corner in my bedroom, which is my meditation corner, and that is all I do there. So even just sitting there, like out of association, <laughs> makes me feel relaxed. I used to do all my work on like the dining table or the sofa, but I found it would roll around to 9 or 10 p.m. and I would still be working and then it would be very hard for me to wind down properly before bed. I was also not being particularly mindful or present when I was eating in that space because my brain would still be in work mode. So now I have a good system where I work until about 6 p.m. or so and then I go and leave this workspace and I will go and chill out somewhere else. So now work and rest feels like these two separate things and that's really helped with work-life balance and I know a lot of you watching this are probably freelancers yourself and know that that whole balance can be quite difficult. Have you got any ideas for visual cues for your own space? Share them down below. Thanks for hanging out with me and I will see you next Monday. Bye!